Okay, welcome to church today. It's right at 10 o'clock. We want to get started and honor your time. Thank you again for joining us today. And I hope that uh, today's service will be a blessing to you. We're going to be looking at a couple of different Psalms. One to start out with, if you have your Bible, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is where we'll be looking in just a moment. And if we happen to move pulpit around or turn this way, it's because the wind is blowing, we, the distortion, to make sure that you get a good quality sound. For those who are joining us online, uh, we do want to say welcome to the service. If you want to, if you can pull on in, that's good. Um, you can go to our website, freedomkeystone.com, and you can visit us there, or you can go on our church Facebook page. Also, many of you have already been going to our YouTube channel, so you can see that. And I know that this seems to be, hopefully soon, coming to a close in some way, and then a new normal will emerge, and we'll all go through that together as we've done this together. So it'll be nice to get back together in some form, uh, but we're kind of waiting to see. So, of course, you know our rules that we've kind of implemented, or at least for the time period that we're together. Come as you are, stay in your car. How many of you are still in your pajamas? Great. Okay, all of you got up, and you've gone to Hardee's and gotten a biscuit, and you're sitting there. That's wonderful. Well, come as you are, stay in your car, and, of course, the buildings are locked. And we're going to make sure that as you're here this morning that you enjoy the service and we don't keep you a long time. So 101.7 is where we're at, 101.7 FM. We'll repeat that throughout as we see more people coming today. Um, Psalm 119 is our scripture today. This week was Ava's six-month birthday. So we're happy about that, and I think they're sitting right over there. So I know we haven't been able to see her, and some of you have had a birthday or an anniversary, and we're so thankful for that. And again, once we all get back together, we'll have a big celebration together. After the service is over, we'll have Brian, Maury, and Gary will go around. If you wish to give, if you'd like to give tithe or offering, you just roll down your window. At the close of service, the musicians will play, and you can give through the window of your car. And again, at the close, if you just let Brian and Gary and Maury help you with getting out of the parking lot so that I think last time it was wonderful and it was great, and I know that uh, we'll have a great time together. Well, Psalm 119, uh, Pastor Sam's going to come and read to us, Psalm 119, if you have your Bible, verses 169, and we're going to read to verses 173, Pastor Sam. We're out of Psalm 119, starting in verse 169. Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. Okay, let's pray to the Lord this morning. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather once again in this most unusual way. Lord, thank you that the church is not confined to the walls of a building or to even a location. Lord, many of our Dear friends and family are at home today. Some, Lord, can't get out and, Lord, are providentially hindered. Others, Lord, we just pray that you would be with them as they're struggling with sickness or going through uh, any type of illness that they may be dealing with, Lord. We thank you for those that are here today. Lord, we pray today that you would just help the music, that it would encourage our heart, Lord, uh, the word, that it would speak to us, it would edify us. Lord, for those that are here, just even the simple sight, uh, Lord, we're seeing one another, some for the first time in a long time. Lord, may that just uplift us a little bit. Thank you, Lord, for the nation we live in. We do pray as we begin that you would give wisdom to our president, to our vice president, to our governor. Lord, you would give them wisdom that, Lord, those that are advising them would also, Lord, uh, have wisdom that comes from you. Lord, that they would also see the needs of the people in our nation, in this state, and Particular as well, that, Lord, you would just help us as we come out of this uh, to give us uh, confidence and courage uh, to depend upon you. Lord, we do pray for those on the front lines. We continue to ask that you would do. Uh, have your way. Have your will. Lord, do what you do best, Lord. And we give you credit. We give you thanks. And we ask all these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Pastor Chris, you 
Good morning. You sing together in your car. We'll sing several familiar songs. And you lift it up and just let it fly in your car. Here we go. Leading on the everlasting arms.
Until you know the loving hand that reaches down to fallen man and lifts him up from out of sin where he has grown. Until you know just how it feels to know that God is Bibles, Psalm 34 this morning, Psalm 34, and again, thank you so much for being out today. I know this is super unusual, but we have an opportunity to at least get together and spend some time together. After the service is over, God willing, I'm going to travel to South Carolina, so I ask that you pray. I'll be going by myself. Um, my mom is doing great. Two weeks ago today, as many of you know, um, it was about 11 some uh, right after we were finished with our service uh, my mom went to triple cardiac arrest and had been having some issues that morning my my dad had called she had thought it was vertigo what she struggles with but it ended up being a hundred percent blockage on her main artery and um, so she went to triple cardiac arrest and at, there at the house they lost her twice and then when they got her finally to the uh, hospital uh, they lost her again there, and she was, as you know, she was on life support uh, from Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And then on the Wednesday evening, um, they felt strong enough and comfortable enough to, where she was doing well, her blood pressure, all of the vitals were doing well. They, they were able to take her off of life support. She was breathing on her own. And then the next day, she was sitting up, um, a little groggy, but... FaceTime a little bit. We went to the hospital there in the parking lot and we were able to wave to her. Um, something that my brother and sister and I, we, we've seen pictures of people all across the world doing this with their loved ones, whether it's at retirement homes or with their grandparents or in hospitals. And I, I told my brother as we're out in this parking lot at Greenville Memorial, I said, I never thought we'd be one of these ones who are waving at a loved one. And there she was. And now she was able to come home. Uh, this past uh, Thursday, well, Wednesday night, they let her go home. Uh, I came back this past Sunday, and uh, she's progressed so well. The doctors, in his word, he said, this is a miracle. We don't see this often. Someone has been this uh, bad off to come out, one, in this way, this soon, and to go home. So if you pray for her, she's, she's doing better. Of course, she still has a lot of... Um, strength to get back she still has some things that she needs to um, get some rehab and just to get up and walk around as she's doing now and get to eat some more solid food but thank you for praying pray for my trip 
I don't relish the idea of driving almost seven hours again, uh, but when I came back through early Sunday morning, the border to Florida was shut down. They were stopping everyone, even as I left last, or two weeks ago Sunday. They're asking people, what state are you coming from? And uh, so when I pulled in, it was about three in the morning there at the border of Florida. And I said, well, I'm coming from South Carolina, but I'm a Florida resident. I was so thankful I wasn't coming from New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, or wherever it was. I don't know what they would have done, put me in lockdown, but uh, it's good to be home. So if you pray for my wife and kids, pray for my, par my parents, uh, my mom especially. And I know that they are very, very grateful. Thank you for the cards that you sent as well. Well, Psalm 34 is where we're going to look this morning. And then we'll look at one other passage. And I pray that this will be a blessing to you. In thinking about what to share with you, and really I've gone off just my Bible reading. What I've been doing in my Bible reading, as I've mentioned to you many times in our midweek Bible study, I was in Psalm 34 on Wednesday. And I mentioned on Wednesday, I want to go back to that. So if you have your Bibles, you can look there at Psalm 34. We're going to give a little bit of an introduction. Then we're going to talk about the background of this text, and then we'll look at these verses. Well, Virginia Dale was the first helicopter load of ecologists to land at Mount St. Helens after it erupted almost 40 years ago next month. Quote, she said, I just remember, remember how bizarre it was going out into that landscape, she said, of the suddenly gray, ash-covered terrain. It gave the impression of total lifelessness. Uh, Dale at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, she studies ecology or how environments recover after a major disturbance. When it comes to studying devastation, she said, quote, Mount St. Helens was off the scale. Hindsight always proves to be most clear the further you get from an event. The myths, legends of the event, or the stories fade with time when held against the truths of that event or situation. The projections and visions of the future impact of the event can be quite different than what is first conjectured immediately afterward. Noting from this article from the USDA and the Forest Service about Mount St. Helens, they said, quote, the actual day of the eruption Sunday, May the 18th, started out bright, clear, and with no warnings or signs of the impending disaster that loomed just a mile below the volcano's dome. Having spent Saturday night on duty at an observation point just six miles, uh, both of the volcano, uh, David Johnston, who was a volcanologist, radioed in laser beam measurements that he had made early that morning. The status of the measured activity showed no change from the pattern of the preceding month. About 20 seconds after 8.32 a.m., the bulged, unstable north flank of Mount St. Helens suddenly began to collapse, triggering a rapid and tragic chain of events that resulted in the now famous widespread devastation. Some of you remember this back in 1980. When the rumblings and the upheaval diminished to a point where such details could be assessed, 57 people, including this volcanologist, this park ranger, David Johnston, had died. The eruption on May 18, 1980, blew away to the top 1,314 feet of the mountain, reducing the elevation of the mountain summit from 9,600 feet to 8,365 feet and replacing it with a one-mile-wide, horseshoe-shaped crater. An avalanche of rocks plunged toward the valley at the base of the mountain and created a 23-square-mile zone of barren land. The debris avalanche contained so much volume that, to put it in perspective, the debris avalanche from the eruption would completely fill all 32 NFL stadiums in the country over 31 times each. A 300 mile an hour lateral blast of hot air and debris flattened the forest that surrounded the mountain. And a cloud of ash climbed 80,000 feet in 15 minutes and circled the globe for over two weeks. Torrents of superheated air, gases, and rocks surged down the mountain's northern face for hours, destroying everything in its path. All told, the eruption blasted more than 230 square miles of forests lakes, meadows, and streams. The assessment also showed that 250 homes, 47 bridges, 15 miles of railways, and 185 miles of highway had also been destroyed, 
It killed, as I mentioned earlier, 57 people, making it the deadliest eruption in U.S. history, and it killed millions of animals and plants. Quote from the Oregonian newspaper, death is everywhere. The living are not welcome. Some of you remember reading the reports or seeing that on the news. Next month, we're almost there in May, will be the 40th anniversary. But think about this, and I want you to maybe contrast that. This is why we're going here, not only in the context of what we're going to see in Psalm 34 with David's life, but what we're dealing with with this coronavirus. It seems like something has gone off, and it's just something that we couldn't have anticipated. Everything was going well, and then boom, here we are. But today, at Mount St. Helens, life has returned with a vengeance. As we celebrate next month the anniversary of the eruption, you can stand back and you can marvel at the ability of natural resources to not only bounce back, but to flourish. And it literally has astounded scientists as life has emerged from the ashes of this destruction. Citing a 2005 Smithsonian article where the avalanche obliterated everything, ecologists have counted more than 150 species of wildflowers, shrubs, and trees with an average of 10 new plant species gaining a foothold every single year. Plants of all shapes and sizes are flourishing. Wildlife has returned to many parts of the area. The pines are reaching toward the skies once again that once were blackened out by heavy plumes of ash, smoke, and debris. So right now, you and I, we may be pretty disillusioned with what's going on with Mount St. Corona. All the things that have been going on in our country, in our nation, I just read this morning early that the governor of Hawaii has said that they're going to go till May 31st with their lockdown. And I know many pastors and several missionaries that are over in that particular area and I can imagine as they woke up this morning the disappointment that they feel. I know how we would feel if our governor, if our president said we're going to go through the month of May and I've listened to some of these governors and some mayors as they've gotten on television and they have shared about their state and as our president has shared and you're just we're just hanging waiting for any good news well, we may feel pretty disillusioned with what's going on. And that's understandable. It's understandable to be shaken, to kind of look at the terrain and see that what once stood and what once looked normal now is gone. It seems to be vanished. We read reports, we hear the news about some businesses, even with our governor, who has said some things may not come back and we feel great um, pain for these businesses, these families, these leaders, knowing that the eruption of what has happened just a couple of short months ago, it seems like eons ago, has now changed the political landscape, has changed the economic landscape, even, can we say, the spiritual landscape. Our leaders at home and in Washington are still unsure of what it takes to get towns, cities, and states moving forward. Before the virus, do you even remember what that was like? Before the virus, Politicians would try to change a little here and a little there, coupled with a whole lot of blame and complain. And we still see that, don't we? There's a lot of blame, there's a lot of complaint, there's a lot of changing here and there. The approach, though, that we're seeing now is almost akin to getting back to putting all the pieces of Mount St. Helen back together again. And we know that's a little impossible to do. We understand that we need answers and not arguments. But looking at the aftermath of this particular event in 1980, we can, we can also relate that to what we're going through. Someone has said this, we've heard the famous saying that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. What we do after the eruption in life attitude, they say, is everything. It shapes our beliefs and our desires. Harsh times occur throughout our lives, but it's up to us how we move forward or how we interpret them. Because we're always in control of our emotions despite any given situation. Boy, we can't control a lot of things. I don't know about you, but some people who are there with their kids or their grandkids at home and they're learning real quickly what the teachers, some of them already knew, like 
it can be tough even within a time frame to watch kids as they change classes and now some parents, some families have them 24 seven. Some have been sent home from their jobs and they're just wondering, they're praying, they're anxiously asking the Lord, what are we going to do? The principle of personal choice, how we choose to respond is profound and timeless. The underlying truth is this, how I respond to what happens to me is my critical lever of choice and it's mine alone. This is true for everyone, but especially for believers. We must remember that the Lord is on our side and we can depend on Him and we can trust Him. So that brings us to Psalm 34. Of Psalm 34, Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, this is what he said about this psalm. He said, the first 10 verses are a hymn or a song. The second 12 or the last 12 are a sermon. And I would encourage you, although we're gonna highlight this and we went through this on Wednesday night, Take some time this week to read Psalm 34, to not only read it, but to meditate on it. Read a couple verses, three or four verses a day, and look at what David said. Because David went through an event in his life that was like no other. We're going to see in a moment. And it was, can we say, the equivalent of almost like a Mount St. Helens event, where everything changed in his life in an instant. He was now at the the feet of his enemies, the ones who once uh, sought his head, now he's running to them for help, or he's running for cover from King Saul. The context of Psalm 34 is kind of strange, uh, because in this context, you see the context found in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. Now, if you want to hold your place here, I'm going to read a couple verses from 1 Samuel 21 so you can kind of see where David's at and why he wrote Psalm 34. But David is being pursued by a jealous king. So here's someone that should be doing right, King Saul, who was the first anointed king of Israel, head and shoulders above everyone, someone that people looked up to, someone that being the first king, almost like being the first president of the United States, we revere George Washington, Washington, D.C. We look at our money and we see his picture. We think of this man who could tell no lies, who was someone who was honest, someone who was a great leader. Saul should have been that man, but Saul became jealous. He became fixated on a kid who loved God, who wanted to do right, and could see nothing more than his destruction. But here's David writing this psalm, and the context is very strange, as I've mentioned. In Psalm First uh, Samuel chapter 21, we can see the previous incidents, the violence and the deception that go on leading up to Psalm 34. David was anointed king, you know that. David then went from the shepherd, shepherd's field, from watching sheep, to the battlefield where he took the head off of Goliath. Women, young ladies, all the, the people began singing the praises of this teenage boy. Saul he slain or killed his thousands, but David, this kid, he has slain his ten thousands. And of course, this made Saul very jealous. Saul began to look at David, almost like this young general, as someone that was trying to usurp him. Now, David was marked for death by King Saul. And David's best friend, Saul's son, Jonathan, said to David, my dad is going to kill you. So we see in Psalm 34, David, of course, flees from Israel, and he's going to go to a place named Gath. And this is, of course, where we see Psalm 34, the context. He runs to Gath. If that sounds familiar to you, that is Goliath's hometown. The Bible says in greater context that there were five, perhaps, brothers. There were five giants. And imagine David being so desperate to run from the familiar to a place that was certain death and, of course, impending danger, to where he ran to Gath, the place where he had defeated the, the hometown hero. But here he is. David felt safer running to the king of the Philistines than he felt remaining at the feet of King Saul. He was soon recognized after trying to remain anonymous as the rightful king. People began to look at him as he was trying to lay low and gasp. They said, you're, you're the king. Almost as akin to how Peter tried to lay low when he was following Jesus from afar. This is not a place where David should be. 
but ultimately here he is. And although David was known as a man after God's own heart, with a passion to please the Lord, David was a man who made mistakes. David had feet of clay, and he made sinful choices. Let me read you a few verses from 1 Samuel chapter 21. Look at verse 10 if you want to turn there. It says this, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. He went to Achish, the king of Gath. David fled from the king of Israel. He ran to the king of Gath. The servants of Achish said to him, This is David. This is the warrior. This is the boy who defeated Goliath. Didn't they sing of him in dances? Saul, his thousands, David, his ten thousands? David laid up these words in his heart and was so afraid. He, he was discovered. He was found out. And here's where things take a turn. And verse 13, and he changed. David changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands. He scrabbled on the doors of the gate and he let his spittle fall down his beard. David acted insane. He turned into a lunatic, the town idiot. I guess you could say the village idiot. He acted like he was crazy so that they wouldn't arrest him or kill him or uh, torture him, whatever it was that they were going to do, as they did to Samson when Samson was called. And David began to just scratch at the gates and foam at the mouth. And note verse 14, then said Achish the king unto his servants, this man is mad, he's crazy. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of mad men that you brought this fellow to play madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? This event leads up to Psalm 34. Because David has now suffered a terrible loss. Imagine the landscape changing for David. He's at home. They're singing about him. He's a national hero. They take the sword of Goliath, and it's actually put into the temple, as it were. It's put into a sacred place. David is a hero who said, is there not a cause? But now everything has changed. David has had to flee for his life. Everything has erupted. Everything, the topography in his life has changed. And now here he is looking for refuge from the evildoers. Boy, I tell you, we're looking at what's going on in our nation right now and in the world, no doubt. Even to where the UN has just said this week that get ready, the UN of all places, that there are famines and um, Things coming to the earth of, here are the words, UN, of biblical proportions. And we see that even the world is noting some of the things happening on this planet that you can't really explain other than to go to the Bible and say, wow, this is strange. Buckle up, get ready. The topography of the life that we once lived or that we, we enjoyed just eight weeks ago, things are different. And... They keep echoing these statements. The new normal, the new normal. We're all wondering, well, what's that going to be? What's that going to be like? Well, for David here, the new normal for him was to be covert, to try to hide, to make sure that he could escape by the skin of his teeth, to not be killed. Never, I guess I'll never go home. I'll never be able to go back. But remember, God had told Samuel, who then came to David as the kid, anointed him and said, you will be the king. But he did become the king as a teenager. He didn't become a teen as a 20-year-old. He had some time in between the anointing and the ascension when he actually became the king. And often in our lives, the promises of God seem so far off. I'm not trying to spiritualize the text, but just to put it into a greater context, that David, a man with feet of clay, a human like us, he still struggled. He made wrong choices. He put himself in a position where he wasn't sure if he would make it out, and he had to even act a, a kind of crazy, like an insane person and didn't know how it was going to end. I don't know about you, but we don't really know how it's going to end, but I love the old song. I read the back of the book, and we went. That means we, as in the saints of God, the Lord of glory, we don't know how things may end, but according to God's word and his promises, it's too early to jump ship. We shouldn't jump ship. We need to be patient and wait on the Lord. Isaiah reminds us, they that wait on the Lord 
shall renew their strength. Even the youth shall faint or they'll fall. Even young people have to have a break now and then because they get winded and they get exhausted. But they that wait on the Lord, and that's the encouragement today that we see in David's life, that David, in this time of change, in this time of difficulty, David not only waited on the Lord, as we see in Psalm 34, he encouraged others, and he was glad, and then he invited them in and said, taste and see, the Lord is good. By the way, he wrote this psalm from a cave. Maybe your house is starting to look like a cave. You would not want to invite anyone in. Maybe worse, some of you with teenage boys, it's beginning to smell like a cave or a barn. It's beginning to smell worse than it looks. And David is here with his men on the run in a cave after he escaped from Gath. And it's in this cave where Psalm 34 is written now. Let's look at our psalm if you would. David made some painful choices along the way. But can we say this? This psalm literally gives us the ABCs of God's faithfulness. The ABCs of God's faithfulness that he will never let his children down. He does allow us to go through the hard times. I'm reminded of how eagles teach their eaglets. Is that right? Their eaglets to fly? You know what that's like. They kick them out of the nest. Some of you are ready to do that with your kids. Some of you are thankful that you've already done that years ago. But they, they basically drop them out of the nest. And then they're falling. They're flapping. They're not flying. And then that, that mama eagle comes down, swoops, and gets them up. And they're teaching them how to fly. But they're kicking them out of the nest. Could it be that through this, can we just say that God has kicked us out of our comfort zones? What we know as familiar the things that we knew as normal and now God has used this and through his word by his Holy Spirit to draw us closer to God to the things that matter most so that we can get kicked out of our comfort zone so that we can once again get our eyes focused back on the Lord because without him as the Bible says we can do nothing it's not that we're living by as Jesus said and the Gospels give us this day our daily bread, but the UN just said, as I mentioned, untold poverty, great uh, famines of biblical proportions are coming to the world. And boy, can you imagine living in that day to just go day by day to get your substance, your, your nourishment, your food? Well, David in Psalm 34 understood that. So finally, David wanted God's blessings in his life. And in spite of his many failures and sometimes his flagrant sins, David kept coming back to the Lord. He continued to repent of his sins, seeking God as his chief joy and his treasure. David wasn't just trying to go to God for his blessing, but he continued to ask God for his help. And he saw God as his source of supreme blessing. He said, God, you're all I need. Even though I'm here in a cave, I'm on the run from King Saul, God, you are all that I need. So David tells us in this psalm how to enjoy God and his blessings, which means to fear him and to walk in his ways. Now, here's the highlight. I'm going to give you five points, and I'm just going to lay them out to you. If you're writing down, you can take these down. If not, you can go back and watch these on the video. What can we learn from this psalm? Number one, praise, that is worship is my primary mission in life. You know, we were created to be in a relationship with God. You hear it often said that there's a, a void in every human soul and every human heart. And it's a God-sized void or a God-shaped hole that only He can fill, that many try to fill with other things. But worship or praise is my primary mission in life. That is, I'm here to worship God, to look at what He's doing. And some of the lessons for the kids that you've seen on YouTube or our Facebook channel, uh, the teachers are talking to their children, to the kids about creation or about the gospel and how that God has put everything in its place for us to look at not just the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the mountains, the beach, all of these things that we miss, but so that we would look past creation to the great creator. There's a reason that we're here, and that is to worship the Lord. So David says in verse 1, he says, 
We need to bless God for rescuing us. Don't blame God for our predicaments. Some people say, well, where is God? It's his fault. Well, the Christian, David's perspective, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. He says, I'm going to bless the Lord no matter what time of day or night it is. Mount St. Helens erupts. Coronavirus comes on the scene. Jobs come and go. My health comes and, and, and it's gone. But I will bless the Lord at all times. And he said that on purpose because praise is my primary mission in life. We should also boast in the Lord and not brag on ourselves, he says in verse 2. My soul will make her boast in the Lord. So we don't brag on self. I think that's kind of, this virus has removed a lot of bragging from a lot of people. Because we have nothing to brag about other than the Lord. Then three, we need to congregate. Let me put this so it's not taken out of context. We need to congregate, not isolate. Look at verse 3. He says, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. We say this often when it's normal. They're no long rangers as Christians. Boy, haven't you felt that you just want to get back together with people? Yesterday we were shooting videos for a while and we had humans up here, other humans that we hadn't seen in a little bit. They were like human beings. My kids were like, there's other people that exist and that are not on the TV. We see them. They're, they're close enough even to touch and to breathe on. Human beings. Don't be a lone ranger as a Christian. Well, here David is saying, come, let's exalt the Lord together. You know, we need to congregate in the house of the Lord. And when it's appropriate, we'll do that. But right now, here we are in the parking lot. Number two point, deliverance is God's answer to all those who cry for help. God delivers us. He delivers in ways that we don't think. He delivered Samson by giving him the jawbone of a donkey. The donkey's jawbone had been lying there for who knows how long, and he picked it up when 1,000 Philistines came upon him, and he saw this, and there it was. With Moses, he had a stick, and he hit the waters of the Red Sea, and it parted. The Egyptian armies were behind them. The waters were in front of them. How will we be delivered? God delivers those who cry for help, but it's never the way we think. God delivers me from my fear in verse 4. He said, I sought the Lord. He heard me deliver me from my fears. Verse 5, he delivers me from my shame, from my disappointment. He says, they looked to him, were light, and their faces were not ashamed. God will deliver his children. Verse 6, he delivers me from troubles. I can cry for help, and the Lord will take care of me. Verse 7, he delivers me from dangers. He says, the angel of the Lord camps round about them. God will take care of us. He leaves the light on for us, as we know. Number three, quickly, the fear of the Lord is the key to our rescue. You can see that in verses 8 through 14. I won't look at all of this, but he says here in verse number 13, guard what you say. Boy, that's been difficult because you want to throw something at the TV when these guys come on television, these politicians, or these talking heads. You just want to, ah, when is good news coming? But note here, David says, keep thy tongue from evil, thy lips from speaking guile. Guard what you do. Guard your relationships. God is in heaven. We are on earth. Let's be careful. Let's wait on the Lord. Number four, quickly. Deliverance is God's answer to those who cry for help. That's verses 15 through 18. Look at verse 15, if you would. It says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. He's watching you. Jesus put it this way, as a, as a hen or a mother hen would want to gather her chicks, little chicks. Jesus, God says, I wish I could gather you in. I wanted to bring you close, but you wouldn't have it. God, as a mother hen, our father, he is gathering us in. He's wanting to take care of us. And although it seems that the, the rocks are shooting up into the air. The ash is so high. The, the skies are dark and the landslides are coming and the topography has changed. Here is God saying, you can hide in me. I am your rock. I am your fortress. You can look to me and I will be your salvation. He says to the righteous, I'm watching you. I'm taking care of you. But to the evildoers, he says, I'm against you. He says in verse 18, I'm looking at the humble, the brokenhearted, and the crushed, or the contrite. 
but not to the proud. And then finally, number five, he says this, there's no problem that's too difficult or any situation too desperate for me. Look at verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Some of our grandparents, some of you, your parents, maybe even some of you that grew up at a time when it was not, uh, well, maybe it was like now. The unemployment, now our country is well over 20 plus percent because of the sudden job loss of many. Great, the Great Depression was over 30 percent. We look at pictures of that day and age and we look back on certain eras of time and we see, wow, great loss and suffering and poverty. And we look at our day now and we look at what's to come and we ask, Lord, these are great afflictions. Lord, what can we do? What will we do? And here David, writing the psalm in a cave, after feigning madness and acting like a fool in front of this king, and running from a righteous king, one that was rightfully on the throne but had lost his way, David now sits in a darkened corner of a, a damp, dark cave. And he sings this song to the Lord and his men sitting around him with their shields, with their swords, with their bows, no doubt discouraged, somewhat depressed, looking at their surroundings. There's nothing there to boast in. Look at us. We're the mighty men of David. Look at us. You're the, you're the, the giant killer. Look at us. Here we are. And David said in that first verse, I will bless the Lord at all times. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. I don't need Kenneth Copeland or Joel Osteen or these guys to tell me that my best day is coming for Friday when God says that many of us believers, those who live righteously shall suffer persecution. We will not have a bed of roses to lie upon. And that just gives us great hope knowing that as Christ laid down his life, he suffered for us. He gave us the example that when we suffer, we can count something that we suffer with him and that we are like him. Finally, he guarantees in verse 22 deliverance. Look at verse 22. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants. None of them that trust in him shall be desolate. God will not leave you by yourself. By the way, David didn't stay in the cave. We feel like we're in a cave right now. We feel like this is where we are. And even if we die in the cave. By the way, if that's the worst we have it in this life, guess what's waiting for us in heaven? We have the Lord. We'll be in his presence. We'll be with our loved ones. We'll have a new body. We'll have a new home. Even if all we have in this life is a daily bread, a darkened corner, and a damp cave, and that's it, we have the promise of God that he will not leave us desolate. For whosoever shall save his life, Jesus said, shall lose it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? And boy, we just want to get things back to normal, not just the whole world, just normalcy, but lose his own soul. Here's my concluding illustration. John was born on a sheep farm 200 miles from London. He left for Oxford at the age of 16 to study. But because of the periodic eruptions of the Black Plague, he was not able to earn his doctorate until 40 years later. It took a while. Nevertheless, John was considered Oxford's leading philosopher and theologian at the time. In 40 years, when he was in his 60s, he became a preacher, but was soon disappointed when he learned that he was set back from the pastorate because of his attacks on the papacy or on the Pope and the Catholic Church. Rome, in, in the meantime, had demanded support from England, a nation struggling to raise money to resist a French attack. But John had advised his boss, John of Gaunt, to tell Parliament not to comply with Rome's demands. He argued that the Church of Rome was already too wealthy and that Christ called his disciples to poverty and not to wealth. If anyone should keep such taxes, it should be in the local government. Such opinions got John into trouble, and he was brought to London 
to answer to the charges of heresy. The hearing had just gotten underway when shouting filled the air. Soon they erupted into an open fight, a brawl, ending the meeting. Three months later, the Pope issued five edicts against John, in which he was accused on 18 counts and was called by the Pope himself. John was the master of errors. At a subsequent hearing before the Archbishop, John replied, I'm ready to defend my convictions even unto death. I have followed the sacred scriptures and the holy doctrines. He went on to say that the Pope and the church were secondary to scripture. And that didn't sit well with Rome. This is what John had written. This is what John believed. He deepened his study of the scripture and wrote about his conflicts with the teachings of the church. He said about communion or the mass that the bread while becoming by virtue of Christ's words, the body of Christ does not cease to be bread. That's just what it is. On indulgences, he said, it's plain to me that granting indulgences, it blasphemes the wisdom of God. And to the confessional, he said, private confession was not ordered by Christ and was not used by the apostles. There's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus. He reiterated the teaching on faith. Trust fully in Christ alone. Rely altogether on his sufferings. Beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by Christ's righteousness. Believing that every Christian should have access to the Bible, John began to translate the Bible himself from the Vulgate into English. The church bitterly opposed this by saying, we will not have the Holy Scriptures trodden under the foot by a swine. White marks. John replied, Englishmen learned Christ's law best in English. Moses heard God's law in his own tongue, and so did the apostles. Now here's the close. The very factors he was ordered under house arrest. They didn't kill him. They didn't burn him at the stake. They ordered him under house arrest. And it was during his house arrest that he completed and really the lion's share of his translation was made. I know someone has said that Newton invented, I think it was uh, calculus or something under house arrest. So what are you doing under house arrest right now? Here's John who translated the scriptures into the English language. John, his name is Wycliffe. John Wycliffe lived to see the first complete English translation of the Bible, but died shortly thereafter in 1384. As this is prior to the printing press, it took 10 months to produce one Bible. There are 170 copies of this Bible that survive today. He left an impression on the church, so much so that 43 years after John Wycliffe's death, note this please, the officials of the church dug up John's body, they burnt his bones to ashes and threw his ashes into the river named Swift. But still, they couldn't get rid of him. Wycliffe's teachings, though suppressed, continue to spread. As a later, later chronicle observed, the book hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, Avon into Severin, Severin into the narrow seas, and they into the main ocean. And thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which is now dispersed the world over. His followers were burned at the stake with copies of the Wycliffe Bible tied around their neck. When we started our talk this morning, I mentioned to you about Mount St. Helens and the eruption and the ash that fell from the sky and the darkened clouds and the topography that had changed. And now you look 40 years later, even then, four to five to 10 years later, Things begin emerging again, life coming from the soil that was charred, that was burned, that was flattened. I don't know about in your life and mine, we're in this together. Things are different, but from the ashes, from difficulty, from hard times, even from, we can see the life of John Wycliffe, who 100 years later, William Tyndall was born. And William Tyndall was someone that helped to really where we get the King James Bible, the translation initially, much of Tyndall's work, who followed after John Wycliffe, who stood alone and died somewhat, not realizing all that would come. Right now, here we are, we're in lockdown. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know this, things have changed. 
but God has not changed. We can trust the Lord, whether it's the Black Plague of John Wycliffe's day or the coronavirus of our day or whatever is to come tomorrow. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We still have a choice to make how we respond to hard times in 2020. And 2020 is not over. It seems like we've been in 2020 for two years now. It's not over yet. But we can trust that the Lord knows what he's doing. He knows where we reside and what cave we're in. So let's thank the Lord. Let's bless the Lord. Let's invite others. And let's remember that we will have afflictions, but he delivers us from them all. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this morning we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness. Lord, how you are long-suffering with us. Lord, you have given us all blessings and benefits. And Lord, they trickle down as a eagle pushes her young out of the nest so that they can begin to fly. They can begin to flap their wings. Lord, you say to us through Peter that we should desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. We need the meat of the word as well as the meat. So, Lord, help us as we grow through this time of this virus and separation, that, Lord, we will stretch our spiritual muscles. We will engage, Lord, those things that in many of us have been lost somewhat. We have forgotten how to use them. The knees of prayer, the cries of the holy, that we may once again get to the place where we point our face and our hearts toward heaven, toward home, and ask you, Lord, to have your will, to have your way, and to do what only you can do, Lord. As we're here in the cave, Lord, we pray that you will hear our prayer. You would listen, Lord. We love you, we trust you, and we thank you. And now, Lord, all God's people said, Amen. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. We don't know, but perhaps next week, we'll see what the governor says on Monday or Tuesday. This task force is met, so that we may meet differently next week. We may meet like this again. But do you enjoy doing it this way? Is this good? We'll see what they say. So please, if you would, be in prayer for me as I travel to South Carolina. Lord, we'll get in sometime tonight. Uh, don't forget to go to our website. You can see what's going on there, freedomkeystone.com. You can also go to our Facebook page. You've got our Awana teaching videos, midweek service. You've got the Sam and Caleb show, things that you can watch and enjoy. Uh, Freedom Kids as well, which is loaded up and should have already gone off this morning at about 10 o'clock. Um, our service today will be uploaded later today on YouTube and on Facebook. So I hope you enjoy that and share it. Let me leave you with a verse that we've been leaving with every Sunday, John 14, 27. I pray that you can... Uh, have this in your heart, hide it, memorize it. Jesus said this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. No matter what comes this week, or what you've gone through these last six, seven weeks, um, we can have peace that passes all understanding. I wish that I could just give you a big hug, and we love you. I was thinking about many of you last night, and I'm talking to my mom and just seeing how that God has blessed in her life, a, a, a real miracle. And just to be able to see my blood family is one thing, and I love that. But the family of God, and seeing you out here is something special. And you are family, and we love you, we appreciate you, and we will be together again. But until then, keep looking up. The Lord loves you, and so do we. God bless you. You have a great day. Blow your horn if you say amen. Correct you out if we would, so we'll have our guys correct you out. See you next Sunday.